through 5 and verse 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day Jonah started into the city, he proclaimed 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on a sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. The word of the Lord. This morning, I would like to talk to you about spiritual health, talk to you about um, the status of our hearts, and I'd like to do that through the story of Jonah. God went to Jonah and said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to share my message with the Ninevites. We, we come into the third chapter today, but I really feel we need some background to fully understand the story this morning. And we go back to the first and second chapters, what we see is Yes, Jonah's asked to go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was the most important city in the nation of Assyria. And Assyria was the rising world power in Jonah's day. They had a proper wall around eight miles of the innermost part of the city, that circumference wall. 175,000 people lived there. But then in the administrative district of the city, uh, scholars tell us that it would be a circumference of up to 60 miles from one end of the city to the other. So it would take you literally three days or so to walk from one end of the city, again, to the other side. And what we know about Nineveh doesn't come really from Jonah, but it comes from a contemporary prophet, Nahum, in the Bible. And he talks about how destructive the Ninevites were, how evil they were. Uh, He tells us that they were guilty of evil plots against God. They exploited the helpless. They had cruelty in war. They were involved in idolatry and prostitution and witchcraft. They were a city that they were known for their wickedness. And Jonah is asked to go to this enemy of Israel. Many of his own countrymen had experienced their atrocities. And if there was the last place in the world that Jonah wanted to go was outside of Israel, about 500 miles northeast to this place to share then a message of gloom and destruction 
to these people, a message of judgment. So in chapter 1, we see that Jonah doesn't receive this invitation very positively from God. He has contempt in his heart for those who live in Nineveh. So instead of going northeast, Jonah goes as far west as he possibly could. He goes down to Joppa, and there he works it out with some sailors to get on a boat. He hitches a ride with them, and they're going to go across the sea as far west as they can go. But as they're going on the boat, they have a great storm that they come across. And Jonah is down in the hull of the boat asleep, but the other sailors are up, and, and they believe that they're going to die from the storm. They're going to capsize. They're all praying to their various gods to save them. They're throwing over the heavy cargo on the ship to lighten it to try to save it. The captain comes down, finds Jonah sleeping, and chastises him for it and says, Please get up and pray to your God that we might be saved. They even cast lots. They believe, well, something must have, somebody must have done something really bad here for this to be happening. And so Jonah says, I, it's probably me. Let me tell you my story. I'm running from God. God wants me to go there, and I'm going over here. He says, the only way you're going to be saved is if you throw me off the boat into, into the ocean. And, and they say, well, hey, we can't do that. You're an innocent man. But finally they decide that's the only solution. So they throw Jonah overboard. And soon after, what? The storm calms. They all get down on their knees on the boat and they proclaim and praise the God of Israel, Jonah's God. But to save Jonah, the second chapter shows us that God then sends a big fish. A big fish to swallow him, to save him. And Jonah's in that fish for three days and three nights. And as he's in that fish, he starts to come around. His attitude changes. His perspective changes. I guess being in a big fish for three days will do that to you, right? And chapter 2 is kind of a psalm. Jonah talks about his dilemma and the danger he's in and how God delivered him. How God came and sent the whale and saved him from being out in the sea where he would have surely perished. And now he recommits himself a vow to God that he will go and he will preach the word. He will not walk away from his responsibilities. And so God takes the whale and, and spits Jonah out then on the shore. That's what he does. Now as we look at these two chapters, that's what gets us ready for our story today that Carrie just read. But there's some things that we can learn from this background. The first is this. You know, I've had people come to me a lot and say, Hey, Pastor Paul, did Jonah, was he really swallowed by a fish? You know, is that true? Well, many have tried to dismiss this miraculous event as fiction. But the Bible never talks about it or describes it as a dream. Never describes it as a legend. And one thing we need to be careful of is we should be careful of explaining away certain miracles that we would like to pick and choose, certain ones in the Bible we think might be true and certain ones that we think may not be true. You know, out of all of the minor prophets, Jonah is the only one that Jesus refers to. And he refers to this specific story, and he compares it then to himself being in the tomb for three days and then rising from the dead. And I figure then if it's good enough for Jesus... It's good enough for me. But Professor Jay Kessler, who's the former president of Youth for Christ, somebody once asked him if he believed that God can make a fish big enough to swallow Jonah. And this is what Dr. Kessler replied with a very simple trust in an awesome God. He said this, let me tell you, I not only believe that God can make such a fish, but the God who made the sun, who made the moon, who made the stars, who made the universe, if he wanted to, he could air condition and carpet that fish if he wanted to. The God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. The God who gives us power over death. The God who made the intricacies of all the universe. He could make a fish big enough to carry a man, to taxi a man over to a shore. And it's a miracle because it's not something that happens every day. It may have only happened on what? One, two, and three days. But we believe and we trust that our God is an awesome God, and he does things for his purposes. But the other thing that I think we learn from these two chapters getting us ready for our lesson is that we're not so much different from Jonah, are we? When God will ask us to do something that we really aren't crazy about doing, there are times when we will run from him. We're going to run from him as well. How many times has God pressed 
upon our hearts that he wants us to do something. Maybe he's been pressing it upon our hearts for a week or weeks or months or a year or many years. And instead of changing our lives, instead of maybe changing our priorities, our choices, our behavior, changing who we are in relationships, we keep running away from God instead of running towards him. How many times has God asked us not to go to some place, to avoid something? Because every time we don't avoid it, we get ourselves in trouble. But instead of running to God, we continue to run to that place that hurts us. You see, as soon as we do that, as soon as we start to run from God, as soon as we stop listening to God, the result, the guaranteed result for us is the same as Jonah. We will experience failure. But when it comes to failing in life, failing is not the end of the world. Uh, To me, what's important is that you and I, we we don't continue to fail, but that we learn from it so that the next time we can do do it the right way. I I got a job once um, for a summer at Aberdeen Proving Ground. I worked on the blacktop crew. That was a hot summer uh, when I was about um, 17, 18. And... I remember the boss saying to me on the first day, he said, look, you're new at this. You're going to make some mistakes, but just don't make the same mistake twice. You see, that was the message to Jonah. Look, Jonah, you made the mistake once of running from God. Don't keep doing it. And, And that brings us to our lesson for today. And so what do we learn in the first four verses? We learn instead of running away from God, Jonah starts to run with God. It's interesting, if you read the third chapter of Jonah and started there, you would never know that God had come to Jonah, that Jonah had run away from God, that he had all this trouble. It's like God just comes and says, look, I need you to go to Nineveh. Like nothing else happened in the past. And God's good with that, isn't he? God's good of of starting new with us and not only forgiving us and looking at the past, but forgetting about it. So he comes to Jonah And he says, I need you to go to Nineveh. And this is what the scriptures say. The scriptures say, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. And so Jonah goes and he proclaims to the Ninevites a message of judgment. And and in kind of summary, this is what he says. He says, look, you have 40 days. And in 40 days, if you don't change your direction of your lives, if you don't repent, you guys are going to be toast. Right? You guys are going to be history. You guys are going to be yesterday's news. God's judgment is coming upon your wickedness. Now, how many times before, I don't know, the Ninevites had been told this and had not changed their behavior, but this time they do. Now, think about it for a moment. God comes to Jonah and he says, I'm going to give you another chance. God comes to the Ninevites and says, I'm going to give you another chance. We're reminded today that we have a second chance, another chance, God. That's how he deals with us. Does God still desire to use and have a relationship with people who have rejected his calling? Does he still have a desire to use people who didn't listen to him the first time around? Or people who turned a deaf ear to his word? Or even pursued a path that led them to disobedience? The answer to that is yes. And if that weren't so, none of us would be here today. The answer to that is yes, because that is exactly why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, so that we could still be used, even though we have been perfect in our past. So God forgives Jonah. God gives him another chance. And now Jonah is running with God instead of running away from him. And so, how many times has God given us How many times? An opportunity for another chance to get it right, to be more faithful. How many times has God spoken to us because instead of running with him, you and I have been running away from him? If you look at your life today, would you say right now in your life you're running with him or you're running away from him? And so what do the Ninevites then do? The lesson told us. The Ninevites respond with repentance. Jonah speaks to them, and we get the impression every heart is convicted by the message. Every heart. And from the lowest to the highest of society, all the way to the king, 
everyone seems to respond. It's like that light bulb went on. Jonah came and said, look at your wickedness. You need to repent. And it wasn't until he said it, the way that he said it, they finally say, you know what? You're right. And we believe and we're going we're gonna to trust. And that's how they respond. And it's sort of like a, a gigantic revival excluding no one. It's unanimous. It'd be kind of like my hope today in this church. It, you may think, hey, that's not the best sermon you ever preached today, Pastor Paul. Or you may think, hey, it's a good one. But my hope would be whether it's the whole sermon or just a paragraph or one sentence or one thought, that every single heart in this place, and it is unanimous, would turn towards God and to say, I haven't been running perfectly. I want to run with God. That every one of us would be changed in that way. That's what happened in Nineveh. And it's important when, when Jonah spoke that message to them, it didn't say that they believed Jonah. It said that they believed God. They knew that God was speaking through Jonah. They even then, to show that they were repentful, put sackcloth on. Sackcloth is just a, a burly material. It's scratchy. It's coarse. It's made of black goat hair. And it's tough to wear. And what it is, it, it's a public sign of somebody's repentance and humility. It's an outward sign of what is happening inside to the heart. To the heart. And you see, when the people respond in this way, they're saying, hey, this just isn't for show. They even put sackcloth on the dogs and the horses. Can you imagine a dog running by with sackcloth on? To show that the whole nation is going to turn. Not just on the outside. A lot of us can put on a show, can't we, on the outside? But the outside was really showing what was happening on the inside. And so what do we learn here? Well, one of the things is this. If, Nin if Nineveh can repent, anyone can repent. I bet you Jonah was caught off guard. I bet you the last thing he expected, he expected these people to reject God. The last thing he expected was them to repent from their evil and to turn from it. You know, we might know people in life that, well, we don't like them very much because of how they live, the things they do, maybe even things they've done towards us. We may not like a certain person or we may not like a group of people. And when we look at them, we don't think they are worth our time of day. They are beyond hope. I bet you we have people in our life that way. It may be an alcoholic parent. It may be an abusive spouse. That's a tough one, isn't it? It may be a teen or a young adult who time and time again rebels and seems beyond our reach. It might be that, that hateful neighbor that just, it just never ends. A family member who continues to lie and because of their lies, we continue to get hurt. Maybe it's a coworker who's always trying to make us look bad. And when it comes down to it, if you admit it, you don't like them very much. A sin in your life may exactly be that you, you despise them and you do consider them beyond help, beyond hope. But what this lesson shows us, if Nineveh can repent, anyone can. No one is hopeless. No one is beyond being changed and beyond the grace and the love of God. So where does that take us? It's interesting to me that the Bible never says that Jonah's message included a mention of God's mercy. It never mentions that. But mercy is exactly what these people in Nineveh receive. The Ninevites, when they donned that sackcloth again, it wasn't for an outward show. God is going to come to them with mercy because he knows that that is truly what is happening in their heart. If God could take a stethoscope to their heart... He knew the song that he was hearing from within them now. And so what does God do? He shows mercy. Listen to verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. We must always remember, most of all, even in the face of judgment, that God is merciful and compassionate. God loves people. And God is for us. St. Paul says, if God is for us, who in the world could ever be against us? And God is committed always to bringing us back to him so that we can run with him and be in step with him. 
But even though God feels that way about us, let's not be mistaken. God is always against sin. God will call it as he sees it, and God will judge sin, and he will judge evil wherever he finds it. So while God still loves us, he will not overlook our sin. For if he did overlook our sin, he really couldn't be for us, could he? Because he wants what's best for us. So our sin has to be judged. It has to be destroyed. As the New Testament says, it has to be crucified by Christ, put to death and put behind us. But the good news for us is just like that for the Ninevites, is that God does not want anyone's destruction. What God wants is God wants our salvation. His purpose for humanity has never changed. He wants us to receive the gift of salvation and the wholeness that he offers to each and every one of us. And we can receive it, not because we deserve it, but because he wants to give it. And it's interesting. Jonah goes and preaches. The people here, they become a new creation. And that's what God wants for us. So what did we learn from Jonah? If you're running from God, folks, it's not going to work. And if you're running for God, if you've been running from him for weeks, months, years, you got to be exhausted. You just have to be exhausted. So maybe it's time, like today, instead of running away from God, to start to run with him. Because you'll be blessed by that, and so will the people that you share life with. And let us remember that no one, Jonah, the Ninevites, us, the people we know in life, no one is beyond the grace of God, because God is merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Jonah knew it, the Ninevites knew it, and hopefully we know it. And so I wonder, when it comes to how we run, if God were to put a stethoscope to our heart, what song would he hear? Let's pray. Please stand. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we, you know, look at the story of Jonah, we could probably spend hours and hours upon all the lessons that are there, but help us to see, Lord, that as your word comes to us, may we be changed, may we believe, and even though we may not put sackcloth on, may our lives, our hearts show the change that needs to occur, that they be a representation of that. Help us, Lord. Sometimes running with you, changing our lives means it's, it's risky or it's something we've never done before. Give us your assurance and your love and your grace. And help us, Lord, not to be closed off to others in life, but to always know that not just a miracle of a fish, but you can bring the miracle of a changed heart to anyone. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.